From New Jersey, this is Low Fidelity. I'm Jeff Heller. And I'm Mike Labrie. On this episode, we will be discussing the topic, to tour or not to tour? If you want to support Low Fidelity, rate and review us on iTunes, subscribe to us on our Reddit and YouTube channels, and follow us on Twitter with the handle Lo-Fi Podcast. All the links you need are in the description, but please, if you have any feedback for us, feel free to leave it in the comments on this episode or send us an old-fashioned email to feedback at lowfidelity.info. Welcome back to Low Fidelity. We are now in our third episode in our suite of XTC review episodes, and uh, we're taking a break from doing a review to discuss bands that stop touring, decide to go on tour for too long, just a nice assortment of different situations, and uh, let's see if we can pull some ideas out of this or just kind of get a sense of whether artists even like touring or the ones that do versus the ones that don't. Before we get into our topic, yes, I do want to, again, we're working within the same artist, so I just want to bring up some errors <laughs> from last time. First of all, I just want to correct a mistake I made, which was about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was 1962, not 1952. Oh, okay. So that whole <laughs> 20 year thing. <laughs> That's a, a, a big mistake, but I see what happened there. Yeah, like not the worst, but it makes more sense with that lyric. I didn't even pick up on it when I listened to the episode. No. It's so funny. Yeah, okay. It bothered me, and so I figured yeah. let me just mention it. And then the other thing is we never mentioned the bonus tracks. I know. I was thinking about them the entire time as we were reviewing that album, and it really did feel like once we got to the original end of that album, that was a complete thought in and of itself. But those bonus tracks, I gotta tell you, I remember having very little to say about the bonus tracks on Drums and Wires. Yes. I loved the bonus tracks here on Black Sea. Yeah, I think they were spectacular. And to me, it feels less like uh, tracks that would have belonged on a previous album because Drums and Wires, I felt those were better for go-to. They didn't really have to be included here. Not to mention that it threw off the pacing of the album. Whereas these in particular, it, I mean, it's tough to follow up Travels in Nihilon, but if you're going to do it with... That was my point. Yeah, like yeah. that. that is such an ending to that album. What do you do after that? Well, I mean, you completely throw it up and put in this really cute pop song. I love Don't Lose Your Temper. It's such a, a super fun little pop rock song. Um, to me, again, that felt like it could have been a Drums and Wire song for some reason. I, you know, I, I disagree. I think yeah. it does follow their progression very nicely into Black Sea just because they follow that same kind of poppy. Well, yeah, I can see what you're saying. I think the sound quality was up to Black Sea's mm-hmm. uh, uh, par, but the actual musicality and lyricism could have gone back to Drums and Wires. I can see what you're saying about that. I really that. like the song, though. I mean, regardless of where it fits or how it came to be, I, I thought it was a great little addition. It's only one of three though Mm -hmm. the other songs i enjoyed them too but they are back in the i don't have a whole lot to say about them i didn't have much to say right there about don't lose your temper but we're not reviewing the album right here so i want to be a little bit brief but so what were your thoughts on the the two other songs like smokeless zone in particular well smokeless zone i actually really enjoyed although funny that they brought in the harmonica in this case which is engineered to a point where it just gets distorted to sound like human breath more than an actual harmonica which i liked but at the end especially it got tired and they really play on that to to their credit they kind of know that it's that's become a trope and so they kind of use that and you hear the breathing noises i do really like where they took that not to mention smokeless zone where it's like all about breath right and so the fact that they play upon that with harmonica i mean it's very cool that's just so cool and so well thought out so i do appreciate that and then the somnambulist i jeff i love this song i like the vocals but it's such a moody and atmospheric song i really want instrumental only of this song i could see that yeah i I, I want to just sit and chill back and just play this on loop for like half an hour and just get into the zone with it. It really brought things down for me and I didn't think it was that particularly interesting in the melody. Mm -hmm. Hence why this is where I'm going to agree with you. I don't have much to really say about it. Although do I feel that it shouldn't have been included? I'm not going to go that far. I do feel like... It's so tough with bonus tracks like this too because how do you frame them in the larger conversation? And so confusing to me because when I originally listened to this album years ago, I had no idea that these were bonus tracks and I just felt it was like this natural progression. It ended better than Drums and Wires, definitely. Gotcha. Other than me not feeling that great about the last track it still felt like a consistent whole but even just to find out that travels in nihilon was the last song like i get it yeah. i totally understand that but the fact that these songs were added on there i feel like it didn't do any damage it's fine that they were on there like that we'll talk about this when we get into english settlement but those tracks on there are part of this because it is a double album in the meantime we are going to discuss to tour or not to tour we're going to look at artists who have made this decision in a myriad of ways but it kind of gets categorized to a degree of artists who never toured maybe they made public appearances Appearances, but they didn't take that multi-leg national or international trip to play music for people. That is certainly one category. So they never toured at all, basically. Then you have those that toured and stopped for some reason. And that is where we're going to have some really interesting anecdotal uh, things to go over. And then lastly, we're going to talk about artists who tour and come back. And I say jokingly that they tour for too long. There are definitely differences there in terms of why they come back or how long that they're back for or what has to change in order for them 
to continue. But first, Mike, I think it'd be best if we talk about pros and cons. What is the incentive of touring? The obvious thing, I I think there's two obvious things. One is, well, when you tour, people are buying tickets. That's revenue. The other is by touring, whether it's by yourself or with other bands, it's simply exposure. It's gaining new fans. I've certainly done this where I've seen opener and I'm like, oh my God, they blew me away. These days, an example I always like to give people is I remember seeing Portugal the Man open for uh, Forgive Durden and Gatsby's at the Trocadero and the first time they played The Devil it just blew me away. Here we are in 2017. Portugal the Man's got the number one song in the country, depending on what kind of chart you're looking at. And it's like, oh, I was able to get in on the ground floor because they were an up and coming band and they were touring and they're just trying to get out there with other like minded, like style bands. Yeah, the incentive is when you're at least even as a supporting group, you're creating exposure. Yeah, it's your chance. The other way you do that, merchandise. Yep. So I the mean, the merch table is so important at every show I have ever been to, especially if you're an opener too. I feel like because yep. you get to go back and hang out there while the other bands are playing and actually be personable with people, and that's another chance. It's like all these are different ways of doing marketing, but it's very important that you do so. Right, and that brings us to the bigger reason of why people tour, and that is money. When you're a band, you want to go on tour, or not even want to go on tour, but you want to make money. The way to do that is performance, because in standard contracts that we've seen over the decades, the artist basically gets nothing for writing the song or for recording it. They get everything for performing it. You may not even own the music that you write. There are even instances where artists don't have their own performing rights, but that is an outlier. There's one particular case, and I could be wrong about the details here, but this astounded me. I remember watching a special that talked about, uh, I think it was Hey Jude, and they said Paul McCartney would not be able to sing Hey Jude without paying royalties on it to someone else, which is astounding. And you know, that that could be like Michael Jackson's name is going to come up a couple times and that was part of it. He owned some of the songs, whatever. Still, the, the whole idea that you playing a song means that you have to then pay someone else is astounding. But again, outliers. The main idea is that you're on tour to play your own music. You get the money from that performance. Hence why we see a lot of artists going on tour. I want to bring up something that you had mentioned, Mike, on a previous episode, which was this band, and I forget their name. You're going to have to fill me in. Sure. The one that said that they would have been racist had they not gone on tour. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the uh, the Tooth and Nail podcast, a record label Tooth and Nail uh, that they've been doing recently. Some of the guys in the band Emery, th- that's what they said is they were down in the Deep South in America and they just got into the music they got into, which was, you know, like Screamo, that kind of era. Had a chance. They were very talented at what they did and they had a chance to go on tour and actually see the world and that opened their eyes to the greater world. And I love that quote from them. I'm like, man, we, we would have been just the cliche Southern racist had we not had that opportunity to go out into the greater world. You know, some people come with that ambition of seeing the world, right? Being a worldwide star, they get to travel right. the world. Yeah, it, it sounded like that was definitely what they wanted to do. But the uh, like the greater results of that were more than they ever could have imagined. Amazing. That, yeah. that to me is just such a great example of this. So yes, that's definitely a good incentive for touring. At the same time, yeah, there's a part of it where, you know, you want to have a good time. You're, you're playing music because it's fun. But then there's girls. There's I don't know if you're a girl band. There's guys. I don't know if it works backwards. But I mean, we always hear from like the heavy metal bands like, oh, yeah, we want women. So we go on tour. To that point, when I look at the decision of to tour or not to tour on YouTube, I find all of these consultants that are basically like, don't ever think that that is a main motivator for going on tour. It's not going to be like that. And you definitely don't want to treat that as the main reason that you're spending months away from home. Please do not do that. That kind of mentality can still exist, but you're going to get a whole bunch of backlash from that in summation. That is why we think that bands go on tour. That covers it. Uh, And just speaking to the the types of contracts that people get and how that's changed over the years, you think about the earliest days where they really didn't, like record sales were important and that could make people money. And as the sales of actual records, as that has waxed and waned, concert performances became more and more important because you may not sell many records, but you can get tons more people to your show who maybe downloaded the album, but also maybe get a copy from a friend, depending on, you know, what decade we're, we're talking about here. And arguably, Mike, because of the stream thing and the economics of that not being Absolutely. up to snuff, there's that added layer to you it could as have well. A, a super fan of a band who has never actually purchased it, but they've been doing it legally the entire time. That is an absolute reality. Let's say what happens when you don't want to tour. Why would you not want to go on tour on a regular basis? There are so many reasons. It's time away from family. It's time away from actually being a creative artist. You know, lots of people can write on the road and there have been a lot of great albums that came out of being on the road. A lot of people need their time and a own time in their studio, in their home, with their bandmates, just separate from the world to come up with their creative vision. Although it's it's a tricky gamble because when you're in an artistic profession, I get this to an extent, you don't 
don't necessarily need to spend that whole time creating music because right. that has to be marketed in some way. There's yeah, that'll really... last you a year or so, and then you do another album, and that lasts you another year and a half or so. Exactly, and there are some instances where radio helps to, or or other commercial methods of, of publishing music or playing music that get your name out there. But really, you know, nothing is better than being out there in person. You have to sacrifice things in order to do that. I mean, if you're going to pick a profession where you're making money for creating things out of thin air, you can't just use that as your sole basis of getting money. So a lot of other artists will become producers or go on staff for something just to make up that extra money in the you meantime. Think of authors. And yeah, there are the mega authors who can make their sole living on writing books and selling books. But a lot of them are guest speakers. They may do consulting. They may ghostwrite other stuff for other people. That absolutely comes in in the music industry as well, who you have producers and you have songwriters who do it for other people in addition to themselves. So we have to put this disclaimer in there that we don't know the financial situations of these artists that we're discussing. Absolutely, yeah. So they're going to have the reasons that they're able not to tour, but we don't really have the details to how that works or you know what deals they made. A lot of times these are in secret. Some of them are very public. But another point I want to bring up before we get into some examples here is the idea that being on tour is uncomfortable. And yeah, yeah. what does it mean to be uncomfortable? You always hear about just the rundown old buses that you're touring in and you're not sleeping in hotels. You're sleeping on the bus. You're sleeping in the car. You don't know when your next shower is going to be. You don't know when your next meal is going to be. Maybe a venue will have a green room for something like that, but probably not. We're going to let Michael Jackson speak for himself on this <laughs> right. one. We have a lovely quote from him. Please excuse the quality of the audio, but you'll get a sense of an artist that is uncomfortable touring and why. The record company usually like for you to support your album and go on tour. And uh, I don't like to. But it's a difficult thing to do. You go from one continent to another, you're sleepy, the time zones are different, you can't sleep after the show, the adrenaline is up here. Well, can we can we just do it again without the just the negative saying that you don't like the tour? Just cause I don't like it. Though. I know, but you see, this I is, go through but hell. What setting up though? I don't understand. No, but I go know, through it's, hell it's, touring. The whole thing I okay, then touring I, is I'll make it positive. Then. Yeah, it's just don't. Well, you know the truth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And rolling. Action, Michael. I love to tour. <laughs> <laughs> you guys must. <laughs> Why are you all start laughing? I'm going to get into it. I love that because uh, things like time zones, you think about just flying from one time zone to another. Maybe one's not that big a deal, but if you're constantly doing that, you're wreaking havoc on your body at that point. We, we didn't even mention that in our own reasons, that you get to connect with fans. And if people love your music, they sing it back to you or they're doing the dances that you do. I mean, that's a pretty powerful way of seeing that what you're doing is changing lives. Of course, you want to be validated in some way. And it doesn't have to be an egotistical thing. It can be a genuine like, oh, that's so cool that someone really loves loves what I do. Let's get into some examples here. We're going to start with bands who never toured or artists who never toured. You can't really say that there's a lot of artists who do this, at least the ones that have the kind of acclaim that they get. We recognize that there are going to be bands who put their stuff on Bandcamp or SoundCloud and don't go on tour because they're not popular enough. You know, that obviously you have to make a name for yourself before you can get the funds and the touring manager, you know, there's personnel involved. So we're talking about major artists who have been popular enough to have that ability and just never took. It. I think the first example really does fit within that line, and that is Harry Nilsson. If you don't recognize his name, you may recognize his version of Bad Fingers Without You, which is just one of the most dramatic songs ever written that McMurray Carey would famously cover later and do a really good job with. He was famous first in the late 1960s. He would gain praise from uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon and would actually be a notable friend of Lennon later on. Because of his talent and his ability, he would have friends that would support him in the industry, and that leads to his debut album coming out on this label called Tower, and then signing a multi album deal with RCA Victor. On his Wikipedia article, this is what they say about him. Nilsson was one of the few major pop rock recording artists of his era to achieve significant commercial success without ever performing major public concerts or undertaking regular tours. Now, there is something that he's done, which was a TV special where he performed in front of an audience. It's kind of funny because for the song Coconut, they dressed up as apes and they were playing the song that way. And it was kind of like, <laughs> all right. it was him, but multiple camera angles all merged into one. So it was kind of humorous there. He did kind of make a public face for himself 
but that wasn't his main way of making money. And coming from the songwriting aspect, he was an industry figure, basically a writer, and that's where he made his money. And he was able to get along well with that because he started in the industry rather than being a creative performing band and then having to get into the industry in order to keep the money flowing. So that's a, a different perspective here. He would record sporadically as well, especially in the later part of his life, but he would mostly write music for others. And unfortunately, he passed away in 1993 from heart failure with a mountain of debt and embezzlement from his financial advisor. Not the best story there, but this is just an example of someone who never had to tour because he's starting from the industry coming in. We don't really see that all that often. There are other figures, though. A very popular example of this is Carol King. She was a songwriter in the okay. Brill Building, yeah, yeah. made a lot of her money that way, very famous for her. And then she would go and make her own solo career, but she would tour and she would kind of get into the whole public facing part of it. But we don't really hear a lot about these behind the scenes people who then are able to take it this far right. and then just not tour. But a very interesting uh, story there. Now, Mike, I want to get your take on this. Yes. Why do you think the traveling Wilburys never toured? I, I think it's very obvious once you go down the list of folks, uh, but this is going to tie into some other thoughts I have on uh, some of like the word I keep using over and over in these episodes. Bands more in my wheelhouse, but Roy Orbison, George Harrison, Tom Petty, Jeff Lynn, Bob Dylan. Uh, come on, it's obvious. Yeah, you're looking at some pretty big talent here. Uh, five different people that are famous for their own things. Exactly. I mean, it's astonishing that they were a band to begin with, and they had some really good songs on that first album. Well, on their only album. But besides that, yeah, it must have been super hard to just to get them in the room together to record exactly. is one thing. Right. And what I immediately thought of it, like it's no way connected to this level. This is what you would call a super group of established, well-known, already famous artists. A band I thought of more from my side of things was uh, an equivalent super group for the scene, The Sound of Animals Fighting, where you have all these incredible artists from RX Bandits, later Chiodos, and you had Anthony Green in there from Say I Was In, later Circus Rive. I, like You can't necessarily line up all of these different bands. Like RX Bandits wasn't even really playing anymore at that point, so those members could go on tour, but Anthony Green's got his own 20 projects going on over here. It's just tough to line those people all up together as well. Another one that I think of, which actually did work out a couple of times, and I love this, was Max Bemis from Say Anything and Chris Conley from Saves the Day. They had a joint project called Two Tongues, where it was actually like two members from each of their bands, and they got together. It was really Max and Chris, but everyone in those bands obviously has their own things going on. There was one particular tour where Say Anything Saves the Day co-headlined, and they got a chance to play one of the Two Tongues songs on that tour. It's like, you got Max and Chris in the same room. Are they going to do a Two Tongues? Yeah, they do and crawl. It's wonderful. So uh, you can have opportunities for that, but I wouldn't expect a Two Tongues tour. Sound of Animals Fighting did do some dates over uh, a period of time, but it just can't be its own regular thing. One of the things I always hear about is bands that don't have the time to do these kinds of gigs with other famous or you know uh, established bands because they don't have any time. They're busy doing interviews for 3,000 different right. outlets, and then they have to do a recording here. They have to do this job there. Again, you know, becoming part of the industry, they're constantly working because they got to make that money somehow. Yeah. In this case, it's astonishing when you see that some of these established groups get together and are able to do these things. But in the case of Two Tongues, I mean, that's just perfect when they're on the same bill. Of yeah, course, yeah. you know, you're expecting them to do to line something. Up, yeah. That's wonderful. So let's go to another example here. An artist that never toured, though this time this is because it's sort of between the artist himself and the fact that he wasn't popular at that time either. But Nick Drake, who's a, a tragic figure, British singer-songwriter of the early 70s, he would have three incredible albums come out and just never sold, never got anywhere. That's so tough where it's someone who gets their credibility, their notoriety, their fandom later on past the point of it being relevant. To me, Texas is a reason was one of those bands where I just didn't get a chance. I was too young and by the time I discovered and was able to appreciate, I, I wasn't there to support them at the time. You know, at least with them, it was a couple of years in a lot of cases. Yeah. With Nick Drake, decades before anyone really heard of him and That's it's because it just started with such a small amount of praise that came from critics and then just over time would swell mm. and he grew up in England. He had parents who were fairly well off, went to Cambridge, but soon dropped out. He made music, but he performed sporadically, be like, you know, little folk clubs, basically. Then he tend to believe that the manager, Joe Boyd, was the one responsible for him never getting famous. But mm. Joe Boyd has a storied career of his own in the music industry. You can't really fault him entirely for this. Also, it's stated in this book, the book is called Darker Than the Deepest Sea, The Search for Nick Drake by Trevor Dan, kind of explains some of this. Trevor goes on to say, any criticism of Joe Boyd's management of Nick's career must be seen in the context of the artist's non-participation in nearly everything he was asked to do. So in this case, you've got someone who was completely unwilling. I mean, in some cases, 
cases, it was hard to get him to record. That's why we didn't hear about him in the 70s. But he would go on to release three albums. Just after his first album came out in 1969, he made his last public performance at this place called the UL Technical College. Obviously, you can tell that he's not playing to big arenas. This is like a small tour. And the guy who headlined had this to say about him. Drake was monosyllabic. At that particular gig, he was very shy. He did the first set and something awful must have happened. He was doing the song Fruit Tree and walked off halfway through it, just left the stage. Wow. He was an incredibly introverted character, as you can see from all of this uh, evidential information here. But his album Pink Moon, that would be released in 1971, you can sense the depression, the insular nature. Things weren't going to end well. And with Nick Drake, unfortunately, he passed away in 1974 at the age of 26 from overdosing on antidepressant pills. Things do get better from him, but posthumously. Pink Moon would later be used in a widely popular VW commercial, Volkswagen commercial in 1999. He would end up appearing on large number of critics' top lists. Gotcha. This is a rare circumstance where the artist himself is just so against or doesn't have the motivation to do all these things that a normal artist would to promote themselves. Or to some degree, it's like I just never intended for it to become what they expect of me. I just wanted to write my songs and perform and let it be. But It's it's tricky, though, when you have that talent yeah. and you know you have that talent. And people really want it. Right. Yeah. But you don't really want to hand it out yeah. that yeah. way. Or, you know, and, and we don't really have a sense of what he was thinking at the time, mm-hmm. you know, why he himself didn't want to go tour. You but never it's, know what's going on in someone's head. Yeah. You never know. And it's just so sad that in someone like Nick Drake, with the amount of people who were saying wonderful things about him, like I said, you can easily find a review of his work online nowadays because his story has not outlived his music. And it makes sense, I think, that he didn't go tour, but it's still a sad story nonetheless. Yeah. Let's move on. We're going to go from bands who didn't tour, just never made a public life for themselves, to those who quit. And we're going to have some interesting stories here. Of course, we are in the middle of our XTC extravaganza here, so the band is going to show up in this. But before we get to them, we're going to talk about the Beatles first, because if you need a great example of one band who was popular, <laughs> extremely so, and quit the road, the Beatles would be the first on that list. This is the case where they got so popular that they quit touring. I, I believe it. I mean, you think about the Beatles. We'll get to the quote. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, there's no need at that point. In a way, there isn't. But it's a very interesting story nonetheless. Before we get to it, let's listen to Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr talk about it. The noise was was constant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it never abates. No. I mean, at first, that screaming was great because it meant we were a success. It was just like, she loved... Ah! And it's like, hey, whoa! <laughs> and after a while, it was like, I can't hear you. Wait a minute, you know... But it had become part of it. Yeah. It was like, that's what happens when we go on stage, this is what happens. Yeah. And but we did diminish a little as musicians. Though it sounds good. <laughs> but why does it sound good? How could it sound that good when you couldn't hear yourselves? We you... played our best no matter what. Was there a specific point you remember when you, you really started getting tired of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt, personally, I was not playing the best I could mm-hmm. because I just had to like stay in that song. It came to uh, the final concert in Candlestick Park. We were all getting a bit fed up, but I was still resisting. You know, you know it's, yeah. it's good. You know, we all keep going. And then we got put in this van, which was like chrome interior, and we're just sliding around in there. And then we all looked at each other and I said, well, you're right. Yeah. This is it. Mm-hmm. Forget it. This is just stupid. Because the conditions were brutal. We can see this parallel with Michael Jackson very easily, where it's just you get too popular. You have to then shield yourself because you're, you know, overexposure is a real thing, too. And it's a lot of pressure on an artist. Yeah, I like what they're talking about, where they end by speaking about the horrible conditions on the road. To them, the first thing they bring up is why are we even playing? Because no one can hear us play, least of all ourselves. Everyone is screaming and so excited that there's really no live performance to be heard unless you're recording the soundboard to then later listen. To. Three years they spent in this atmosphere of touring and not being able to hear themselves. Yeah, that's a lot of time to be in this environment. I mean, I'm I'm surprised that they're not completely deaf at this point, just right. with the amount of screaming they got. But at the same time, it's not the only thing that caused them to leave touring. They actually miss a few details, and that's what I find interesting in the story. We're going to talk about that here. This is in regards to their 1966 U.S. tour to support Revolver, which was released on August 5th. So the tour starts on August 12th, but an American magazine datebook 
book publishes a fiery quote from John Lennon detailing his take on the decline of Christianity on the front cover of their August issue. Now, this quote from John Lennon originally was published in the London Evening Standard in March and didn't really make a dent anywhere in England because it has to do with Christianity. We in the U.S. tend to be a little sensitive towards that kind of thing. I'm going to read you John Lennon's quote. You'll see why they got a negative reception from this. John Lennon goes, end quote, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. His message is a little muddled toward the end there. If you ask me, he's not wrong. <laughs> Time kind of proved it yeah. a little bit, but it's funny. He says rock and roll or Christianity. We're seeing a decline of rock too. So what got under folks' skin, I think more than anything else, was not just the criticism of Christianity. It was the we're bigger than Jesus. It's making a false idol of yourself that I'm sure got under the religious right there. Yeah. And you and I have argued about this before about objectivism and can you be truly objective? And, you know, Lenin in this case is trying that a little bit. Like he's sort of, right. he's, he's testing the waters a little in that mm-hmm. quote, but he is really kind of pulling in his own logical uh, uh, sense of the world at that time. You, you can see he's being sensationalist, but he's also being really honest <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, he really is. And unfortunately it did not go well for him. While in the UK, it didn't really matter much. In the US, boy, was there some blowback. There was a press conference later that month from when he said the quote to address it uh, with an apology. It didn't stop the press from pestering them about that quote from that point on yep. to the point where when they started, and this was, again, the start of their US tour. Okay, so yep. they started getting death threats from groups like the KKK and there were album burning parties in parts of the country. And in one gig, someone lit a firecracker and threw it on stage mm-hmm. and the popping noise that went off, people were thinking gunshots. Yep. Now, August 29th, they have their last show in San Francisco. This is their last ever tour date. Just a little more than half the tickets were sold. That's resulting in a financial loss for the band. I mean, that is for the Beatles we're talking about. That is astonishing. Yeah. This is pre Sgt. Pepper here, but still, I mean, considering that they had leagues of screaming fans, this is quite a, a different kind of issue here. Mm-hmm. So the lack of sales reflected the change of popularity due to the controversy, obviously, especially in contrast to their performance at Shea Stadium one year earlier mm-hmm. where they were playing to 55,000 people. And this was, I think the number was 27,000, something like that at this gig. So. This is so fascinating to me because you hit a point where, I don't really know how to describe or frame it, like you're gonna hit a point where the tables turn and everyone turns on you. I think was just the straw that broke the camel's back and it just happened to hit the right pinpoints of American culture and society. But the Beatles, they, Jeff, they were so huge. Like you can only continue to grow at some point until everyone turns on you. I don't say this from experience at all. <laughs> well, I think though that it, it's right. It was gonna happen this very good point. The way that it happens for them, it's just coincidental that this quote comes out and that's what leads this yeah. turnaround. Lord knows what it would have been had that not happened. Right. And interestingly enough, I think that the incident actually worked in their favor because it only made themselves realize that they need to stop doing this. I would say absolutely from my perspective that this made for a better band. It's really sad to frame it that way. As I see where we're going next in the conversation, my favorite Beatles album. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The impetus for this album being created is the band throwing away their old persona Mm -hmm. and taking on a new outfit. Not changing the the name of the band. They're not that dumb. But (laughs) they instead put on this costume as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The album gets released in June 1967. It is an instant popular classic. Single-handedly started the album rock phenomenon. Well, that's the thing is there's a, a lot of songs on this album that you absolutely can play individually. There are huge singles from this album. At the same time, it definitely works together as a cohesive whole especially as some of those songs later on blend and bleed into each other have those very natural transitions that feel like these tracks feel as if they are one song how do you translate that to a live show yeah very true and you and we're, we'll talk about that with FDC it sounds like where maybe we're going to write music that you can't do as a live show before we talk about that let's get some background as to why XTC left touring because it is going to be slightly different and for that we are going to listen to a little sample here from Andy Partridge in an interview with the Tune Tribe podcast from January January 4th, 2017. Near the end of a, a, another very long American tour, my wife at the time, my mm. first wife, yes. uh, went and emptied all my Valium down the lavatory, flushed them all away. Now, this is Valium that you'd been on since you were a child. I, I Because um, of my mother had a lot of mental problems, right. 
it obviously unhinged me as an only child having mm -hmm. to experience this. Mm -hmm. So doctors in the 60s, oh, poor kids all upset because his mum's bonkers, stick him on Valium. Right. Which they did then, you know. Yeah, oh, the yeah. chicken's not happy, stick the chicken on Valium. <laughs> yes. Oh, the clouds aren't happy, they look a bit, stick them on Valium. You know, it was, a, it was a standard recipe. Yeah. So I was put on Valium from around about the age of 12, 13. And there I am at 26, touring around in the States. My ex-wife didn't like seeing me pop in handfuls of these all day. Understandably. Understandably. Yeah. And I, 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 to me, they didn't do anything. So she tipped all of these away, and we were part of the way through this tour. I didn't know how to get any more. So it's effectively like a cold turkey thing, because Valium is a pretty it, it powerful was, drug. Well, I, I mean, I, I had no concept of what addiction was. From that evening onwards of having this big industrial tub of, of Valium tipped away... Mm. And it was like, yeah, yeah, of course I don't need them. They don't do anything for me. Yeah, I'll just stop. What an idiot. We had no concept of addiction and withdrawal. And over the coming months, my brain started to melt. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't remember who I was. Couldn't remember where I was. Yeah, it really was frightening. And particularly I, to be stranded in the States in, the, yeah. in a high-pressure environment. Well, like I, re I remember, because uh, we drove around in a little tiny van everywhere. It wasn't the luxury of aeroplanes all mm. the time, you know. Mm. And I remember being in upstate New York, just struggling through the snow to get back from some show. And the snow drifts were like three or four feet high. And I said, look, you've got to stop the van. I, I just need to pee. I'm going to burst. And I wandered off into this field, the snow up to my knees or higher, and I thought, I f who am I? I've forgotten who I am. I've forgotten my name. Where am I? Where am I? What country am I in? Jeez. I, I just, my brain was coming undone, you know? Mm, and I, mm. I didn't understand. So, melting brain, no money, fed up with being stuck on the treadmill. These things called panic attacks, I didn't know what they were. I thought yeah. I was going mad. Yes, of course. Uh, nobody was saying, well, that's a panic attack, old man, and it's because you're overworked and you're, you're on cold turkey from value. So when we got back to England, I thought, you know, this, this touring has become too horrible for me. And shit, if the Beatles can stop and make better records, I'm sure we can too. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. I find it funny that there's a lot of this influence from the Beatles coming into XTC's music, but also their methodology. Yeah. Mike, I want to get your take on uh, what you heard. It's it's a hysterical story. It's also a really, really sad story, too, uh, especially now that we just know so much more about, like we were talking about in the previous XTC album, the human condition, just what goes into a man, what makes a human being. And we've learned so much more about that and the, the toll that this kind of work can take on your body. You think about, yeah, you're a rock star. You got all these great things going for you. But man, you're also destroying yourself at this level in the process. So let's talk about the English Settlement tour. Now, at this point, they've recorded Black Sea. They were touring like crazy. Partridge is getting sick of the touring thing and he's like alright let me write songs that are unplayable we're gonna leave our opinion of how well he did with that when we get to our English settlement absolutely, review absolutely because I certainly have thoughts on it even only just basic listening so far yeah me too regardless yeah we know he was increasingly tired of the road having spent years constantly touring and the label even though they were handed this album of songs that were supposed to be unplayable still put them out on the road on well, March 18th 1982 Partridge abruptly stops singing during Respectable Street and this is at a gig in Paris suddenly takes off his guitar and walks off stage. The band awkwardly finish the song and go to find him in the fetal position backstage. Jeez. If you want something more horrifying, the film of him stopping playing, putting his guitar down and walking off on stage is on YouTube. It's like Ooh. a pretty interesting... You know, you don't see him like in the fetal position or anything. You no, just, of course, yeah. He very calmly just fumbles on a line, steps back, takes the guitar off, walks off, and that's it. And that's like the beginning of the end right there. After the collapse, the rest of XTC's European tour was cancelled. I mean, for obvious reasons here, they figure out, oh, he's off of drugs, that's bad um, but still they didn't do anything about it it sounds like and just let him go on withdrawal it was also discovered though that at the same time he also hadn't eaten anything for a few days Crazy. so that would have certainly caused some damage he was nursed back to health and feeling at least a little bit better he agreed to persevere and tackle on the American tour and that would be XTC's first US jaunt as a headlining act this is their time coming to off make... of all that and yes. first American tour jeez 
Jeez, man. This was their chance to basically be a hit in America, which was really pressured on them by Virgin, honestly. XTC go on the road in the US. They have an April 3rd concert in San Diego. And this is Andy Partridge here talking. He says, it all came to a head on our US tour, he recalled. I managed to get through the first show, but it was an awful experience. I was on stage and couldn't remember how to play guitar properly. I was in terrible pain and my nervous system was just going wild like somebody had just run me over in a car. Then on the second night, this was in LA, I cracked up completely. I really believed that I was going to die. It was that bad. I just had to get off the stage and that was the end for me in touring. I just couldn't do it anymore. What do you think Virgin Records had to say about this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Get back out there. Right, exactly. And so they weren't happy, but Molding and Gregory, perfectly fine with this. They uh, stuck with him and said, nope, if he wants to stop touring, we'll stop touring. We'll just be a studio only band. Drummer Terry Chambers, unfortunately, gone. He preferred touring over recording and left the group, which is unfortunate because we've, we've said- We've been talking about the drums so much in these reviews. So much. I mean, not even just the production, but the way that Terry Chambers plays drums is just fantastic. XTC leave touring. They make this album called Mummer in 1983. They go on to make the Big Express in 1984. And Skylarkin comes out in 1986. We will talk about this progression when we get into phase two of our XTC expose. But before we move on, I want to clarify on stage fright. Because when you read about Andy Partridge leaving tour, it's always about he has stage fright. And we've learned the real reason why. Yeah, it wasn't that. I mean, that was the outward appearance of this actual cause. He goes into that on this interview, which is why I really want people to listen Mm -hmm. to it because it is fascinating from that point of view. Now, granted, he understands where the stage fright thing comes from, but it is kind of annoying to see that always the reason that he quits touring when there was more to it. So I think from our perspective of doing the show, I hope that we can change some minds about that, that it's not always just plain stage fright. That is like such a generalized way of describing a condition. And there is such a thing as legitimate stage fright, but there are other factors that can contribute to that as well. And that's the reason why they don't tour, not just because of stage fright. So we are going to leave XTC for now. We will come back to them in our next episode when we review English Settlement from 1982. In the meantime, let's move on to another artist. Her name is Kate Bush. (sighs) How to describe her? You could say she's the female Peter Gabriel because she takes this interesting, strong, conceptual subject matter and has this literary background to back it up and very interesting personality. She makes time for herself and makes everyone else wonder, well, where'd you go? Mm. Especially because she had gotten so much praise in her time. Bring us up to speed a little bit before we play this clip. She was discovered by David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Oh, okay. Family friend, basically. He sees this tremendous amount of talent and in her at 16. Mm. Gets her a li- uh, record deal. She puts out the song Wuthering Heights from the Kick Inside, that album. It's a hit. She's got this singular type of vocal style that's just very, I mean, it's strong, but it's so high pitched. Mm-hmm. The Lionheart Tour is the last tour that she does before going into her own projects. Mm -hmm. And so here's a quote that kind of describes what went into her head when it came to leaving the touring life. Well, the intention had always been to actually do another set of shows after I'd done another two albums so that I could have uh, new material for the next shows. Mm. But then as I got to that, what would have been the fourth album, I'd become much more involved in the whole recording process and and was starting to produce. And it it just became a kind of slightly different path than the one I'd imagined a few years beforehand. So there was never an intention to go for such a long time without doing shows at all. It, It just kind of went off in a different direction. And there were a couple of points where I thought that I would get a chance to do some some live work but for whatever reason it just never it never really happened I suppose you know when albums have taken such a long time to make and then there's always this sort of process post album where you know there's an element of uh, promotion but also making visuals to go with it which I always get very involved in and and then before you know it you know the the time has kind of rolled on and it almost feels like it's it's the time to start a, a new project and I suppose the longer that it got, the more I just started to feel that perhaps I wouldn't do shows again. You know what grabbed me about that? I think it was a very logical point was, well, I want to have a couple albums. So I have some new material to do when I'm out there on the road. Think about all the shows that you go to, at least for me. I know the traditional thing is don't play the new stuff, play the old stuff that I love. Right. And here you have the artist. And I'm sure every artist goes through this. Like I have been playing that song for 20 years. I did put out an EP this year. I did have a solo project this year. Wouldn't you like to hear some of the newer material? Something I love, Matt Pryor, singer for the Get Up Kids and some sort of other side projects the way he always describes it in shows especially solo shows he's like one for you one for me one for you 
one for me. And I love that because it's like, all right, I'm going to play the song that you want. I'm going to play the song that I love next. And whether you get anything out of it, I don't really care, but I'm doing this for me. I think that's a great way around it, isn't it? Yeah. What I take from this quote, Mike, is what mm-hmm. she calls visual projects. Yeah. Which I find interesting because so you, you think music videos. Right, right. And music videos certainly were a part of it. She is an incredible dancer and choreographer. She actually uh, does mm-hmm. do a lot of her own choreography for her live shows. If you look at some of the concert footage, she's not just standing there with a microphone and a band behind her and that's it. The fog machines are going off. She's got dancers all over the place. She has a huge production. She is not doing a very small event, you gotcha. know, like not your standard club. She's doing concert halls and event spaces and making a theatrical production. And so there's a little bit of grain of salt here that we have to take with what she says, because when it comes to the projects that she does, if she just did a basic type of concert, then it, we would be seeing her a lot more often. It's because she doesn't treat the concert experience and the personal connection with her fans as a small thing. She she makes them events because she wants them to be memorable with the audience. And I yeah. think that is an incredibly ambitious goal, but that is a time commitment that you're putting away from making albums and sure. touring. Yep. And we see that, especially in her career, because after her first four albums, she builds her own studio outside of her house. She now has her own time to record mm-hmm. and she has the freedom in her contract to do so. She was very nice instrumental in getting a very lenient contract. And so because of that, she just did everything at her own pace and she would have a major hit in 1985 with the album Hounds of Love, which is what she's most known for. But apart from that, her output would dwindle and she would really only do a couple things here and there. And that would earn her this tag of being a recluse, right? We hear that term all the time. It's the same way that we hear about stage fright. There's a stigma on being a recluse as well. And uh, we're going to play a clip in a second. But before we do, even though she has this tag on her, she also made two albums in 2000, one in 2005, one in 2011, Ariel's and 50 Words for Snow, both of course getting great critical praise for just being as ambitious as her earlier projects, but that recluse tag still sticks on her. Let's listen to what she thinks of that tag. I was speaking to someone about this, the reclusive tag, and I was trying to explain that if you if you had a plumber that didn't go to plumbing conventions or didn't go to plumbing awards, you wouldn't call him a reclusive plumber, you'd just call them a plumber. But people with musicians, it becomes this label, doesn't it? I just wanted how you felt about people still it's this it doesn't seem to go away yeah well i suppose people really like to put things into boxes Mm. and pigeonhole people and i suppose that tag kind of hung around uh for a long time when i when i wasn't making albums or between albums um i can think of a lot worse things to be called this is true and how can somebody who's a reclusive get up in front of three, four thousand people and do all those shows? I, I'm not a reclusive, but um, that just seems to be something that makes people feel comfortable to call me that, I suppose. The plumber analogy is interesting and funny, but to tie in uh, a tangentially related thing to some of our extended fandoms, you know what I actually thought of was cosplay or costuming. You have people that get accused of you're only dressing up because you want attention, and then you'll have people who will make these fantastic outfits and maybe never actually wear them or never want their photo taken, and then you get accused of, well, why did you even do it in the first place? Don't you want the attention? Isn't that the entire point? So it's like you can't win with no matter what you do there. Uh, I think that's maybe a little bit better of a parallel somehow to uh, to the musician here and whether they go on tour. It's like, well, you're a musician. You're writing music. Don't you want your loving, adoring fans to come see you? But what do you think of her take on people are just comfortable putting things in boxes? I absolutely love that description. That's yeah, re- that's really apt, I think. I think it is. I, I argue with it a bit from both sides on this because we're, we're very comfortable having these things that we can assume. And when it comes to like Kate Bush's career, where we see that she left the road for decades, we do want to think that, well, that behavior then means that you're this. Yeah, everyone wants to be an expert on everything. And so if you can classify something, you feel better about yourself. It it can't actually be more complicated than that. It can't be something that you don't know. You have to feel like you know everything about everything. And that's why I like this clip so much, because she addresses that and has an understanding for it, but at the same time negates it and says that's not what happened. People are allowed to go and do their own thing. It doesn't mean they're a recluse. It doesn't mean 
that they're completely introverted, insular, whatever. You're allowed to have your own time. Whatever you want to call it doesn't really matter, especially in something like this. She says it perfectly where it's like, look, I could be called worse things. I think she makes a perfect point as a woman, absolutely. Yes, exactly. What I want to do here is I want to bring up detail about her concert series in 2014 because this is three years after 50 Words for Snow come out in 2011. So it's interesting to me. It took three years, but she decides, you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. I'm going to take this venue, the Hammersmith Apollo or the Hammersmith Odeon in London, and we're going to hold an event. 22 concerts. They do a huge audio visual spectacle. Again, just like her Mm -hmm. earlier tours, she goes on to have this widespread critical acclaim from it. Mike, 22 concerts. Mm -hmm. They sold out in 15 minutes. That is insane. Insane. But from everything I've just heard, to be expected. Right. (laughs) Yeah, very true. Let's talk about some of the results of this because, yeah, I mean, it seems kind of random three years later and here she is putting out this uh, uh, concert series. Yeah, yeah. But following the first week of performances, eight of her albums charted within the UK top 40. This was the first female artist in history to ever achieve that. That's crazy, yeah. Yeah, Hounds of Love would reach number nine. The whole story would reach number six. Those were the highest charters. I mean, incredibly successful. Now, Mike, we're going to go into bands who don't stop touring. Mm -hmm. Now, I kind of subtitle this with paying a premium for nostalgia, which I think kind of summarizes what's going on here. But my first example kind of goes against that, and that is with Dick Dale. Mike, have you ever heard that name Dick Dale before? Think so. All right. Let me see if you recognize this. a miser loop the song was used in the pulp fiction soundtrack that's probably where most people have heard it at this point yeah. not when it originally came out dick dale is uh, still touring but i want to bring up the point that being an artist of any kind doesn't guarantee you health care not in the u.s right and so we are going to see that with dick dale who unfortunately is an american unfortunately guitarist. is an american can you believe we're saying this it's... yeah it's it's unbelievable uh... but it's true because he's an american artist and tours in the u.s he does not have health care he obviously needs it because he is touring for his health. This appeared in a Billboard article. I'll make sure to include it in the show notes. He has renal failure, and uh, it's the after effects of two bouts of rectal cancer. He tours to cover his $3,000 a month medical expenses. And this is a quote from the article. He plays in excruciating pain while wearing a colostomy bag. This is unbelievable and is perfect showcase of America in 2016-2017. Yeah, and and how sad it is that I mean, this is the standard life for artists that they don't have health care. They can't afford it in I, some cases. I know, I've heard that all the time, is they'll have a tooth knocked out or something and just, they can't do anything about it. Right, and they're traveling constantly. Where are they going to stop and go see a doctor? I mean, yep. it depends on what kind of artist you are and where you are at the time that the incident happens. God right. forbid you're in Europe, you'll get taken care of just fine. But we're not going to get too political about this, but it is a reminder. I would like to. <laughs> yeah, no, trust me, we all would like to. But this is a reminder that royalties do come in many flavors and writing royalties are very different from performance rights. In the case of Dick Dale and Miserloo specifically, that song was in the Pulp Fiction soundtrack, but that does not help him because that's writing rights or writing royalties, not performance royalties. He doesn't get a dime when that song is played on the radio anywhere or in commercials or whatever. That's going to the label. He's going to get it when he performs. And so here he is having to perform despite health issues. Okay, let's turn things around. Let's talk about other artists who apparently don't know how to stop. (laughs) Or maybe they have good incentive for doing it. Phil Collins is the first one I bring up because I don't know if tact is in his vocabulary, but his uh, not dead yet live comeback tour to go with the release of his 2016 autobiography, not dead yet Mm -hmm. in, you know, a time period where artists are kind of like, you know, dropping like flies left and right. We lost uh, David Bowie and Prince around this time. And here he is saying not dead yet. I don't know how you feel about this. My take is a little bit insensitive. I think it's playful enough. Where does this come from? This comes from he's I, I remember him talking about back injuries but just being injured from his playing over the years uh, that's what he's getting at here is like oh i don't know if i'm ever gonna be able to do it again and well okay actually i can still tour and play uh, i think in this case he's probably just having fun with it i don't necessarily read too much more into it the reason why i get upset a little bit i mean i know i could be taking this a little too sensitive You're a little as well. too insensitive Jeff. yeah i know well i see it this way because he is part of the culture he should be aware of the culture that he is in he is not a world unto himself when you have fans that are mourning the loss of other artists, which yeah, I mean, you can make the argument that they should be getting over it too. You see, this is like a hand waving. Hey, I'm still over here. I'm not dead yet. It's like, yeah, it's not about you either way. Sting is back on tour. He is touring in support of his album 57th and 9th. I find it fascinating that he is still recording and touring on a regular basis. I've never once seen him say anything bad about touring. It seems like he's got the formula down. So that is some good news right there. We have another interesting tour with Deep Purple, with Alice Cooper. They call it the Long Goodbye Tour. You know, Mike, with Goodbye Tours, who's the most 
famous band that does goodbye tours but keeps coming back. Do you know? I'm sure I do. I'm going to say the name and you're going to see it right away. Yeah. Kiss. Oh, yeah. yeah. Constantly. Every time it's a goodbye tour, every time they come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like it's like clinical at this point where they do it and they just keep coming back, whatever. When I see goodbye tours at this point. Yeah, I don't buy it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So what about Def Leppard, Poison and Tesla? Yeah, that's the, hey, remember this kind of tour. And let me bring up a few others. Peter Frampton and the Steve Miller Band, Chicago and the Doobie Brothers, Jury in Asia, Rod Stewart and Cyndi Lauper. That last one's a little weird to me. I guess. Yes. Yeah, a yeah. bit. What did I say? It was uh, paying premium for nostalgia. Well, this is also a case where any of those individual bands could probably get a small venue. But if you lump them together, you're going to get more groups of fans, you larger venues, higher ticket prices, all that. To that end, that's where I see the mega tours thing falling into that. You get all these artists together of a certain kind. You stamp a genre label on it and you send them off on the road. Everyone loves having nostalgia sold to them. For hundreds of dollars a ticket? I don't know, Mike. I mean, to me, you got to have a better concept than that. I don't know. But then again, you're talking to a guy who barely goes to shows nowadays. Yeah, that's true. Or like if I go to shows, it's like at the State Theater. Jeff, like, I you know. literally just went on a nostalgia cruise for music. <laughs> that's right. And so what a perfect tie into that experience. <laughs> so, Mike, you tell me when I have that cynical aspect towards these kinds of shows, what yeah. is your attitude towards them having just come from one? OK, so it was the Warped Tour Rewind Cruise Etsy. And my take on it was actually very much less about the nostalgia of it and the simple fact that we typically do a cruise around that time of year anyway and I liked enough of the bands individually on the tour the fact that they were selling it as nostalgia kind of never actually entered the picture for me so do me a favor describe the ship it was on who was on the uh, tour so it was the Norwegian Pearl I believe it was it left out of left out of New Orleans we went to uh, just one stop Cozumel otherwise it was a four day tour mostly at sea setup was pretty much the morning everyone's too wasted to do anything so you wait till a little later in the day all the different venues on the ship like the biggest of the big bands will probably be playing the pool deck and they covered over the pool and everyone can be outside the biggest area uh, other venues like the atrium inside uh the smallest bands like the real supporting bands are the ones that want to contest they're playing in one of the bars somewhere there's the the main theater as well and then the back of the ship with the sports deck that's where they did the uh, intimate acoustic shows that kind of thing so there's a little bit of everything everywhere for me the main draw was it was a cruise with Real Big Fish, Less Than Jake. The starting line was also there. Cartel was there. Face to Face was on there. I never got a chance to see Face to Face. I regret not getting to see Face to Face on the tour there. Aaron Gillespie uh, from Under Oath and Almost and also just himself. Uh, he did an acoustic set uh, the very last day. Simple Plan was there. The way they were selling it was and I'm pretty sure that Real Big Fish described it this way was it looks like 2003 just barfed on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and it was that. But for me, it really was just I'm a super fan of these specific bands that happen to be in the same place at the same time, combined with all the other factors of my life. That was just a really good draw. That sounds really well put together because it's different shows happening in different venues, but on the same ship. Right. So you have different shows staggered in the same location versus other locations. And if you're not into this band, well, you're probably into this band. They were very smart about it. And the acoustic show will be going on back over here. And that sound doesn't conflict with the sound over here versus inside. I've been on cruises, of course, as well. I know that that the music can bounce off walls very easily depending on who's playing where but when you have such a coordinated effort to basically supply the music for an entire cruise rather than go through just the standard in audio pop music of today which they usually do right i mean that's a really interesting idea let's put bands in there they're going to be the music and this is nothing new paramore has done cruises for a while now they were advertising kiss cruises on this as well uh the joko cruises jonathan colton he's been do doing cruises for a while like this is nothing new but this was the war tour cruise is like the next level of really trying to super brand it. Do we know if they're going to be doing this again? They didn't announce. I believe I just saw Kevin Lyman announce that he's ending Warp Tour overall though. Wow. So I don't know where that leaves the cruise now. This seemed like it was a success. It definitely was not a sold out ship, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. Switching topics though? Yes. New younger front man. Yeah, go show off the new shiny. Yeah, that's for sure. It's in some cases a continuation of a legacy yes. that we're seeing here too. The first thing we should do is look at probably one of 
the most remarkable stories first, and that is Journey, mm-hmm. who got this new younger frontman. Not because Steve Perry is not in the picture. I mean, he's he's around, he's alive, he's done things, but his relationship with the band is kind of disintegrated over time. And so when Journey wanted to go and do shows again, continue to be Journey, yeah, to keep doing stuff. Guitarist Neil Sean had the bright idea to just go online, stumbled onto YouTube. This was what 2009, I think, mm-hmm. and found this guy from Manila, Arnel Panetta. Now, Mike, have you heard Journey with the new lead singer? You would never know the difference. It's astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing. He is so good at what he does. We're going to play a clip for you just to give you a sense of what he sounds like. I mean, I can tell the difference between him and Steve Perry easily. Yeah, like you get a little bit of the accent there, for sure. The power in his voice, incredible. And so, yeah, Journey's back on tour. And what do you know? They have this interesting lead singer. You should really look up the story of this guy. It's fascinating. I mean, he lived in poverty. Somehow his clips made it to YouTube. Band decides to contact him directly. Becomes the new lead singer after... It's amazing. Phenomenal for what we sound That's like. That's a really difficult situation because you don't want just a sound alike. You want someone that you're going to have chemistry with. And you don't know that just from a cover video on YouTube. Yeah, that's for sure. This whole thing with Queen, at least Brian May and Roger Deacon of Queen, pairing up with Adam Lambert, who was uh, one of the contestants on American Idol. And they're going out as Queen plus Adam Lambert. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I don't know what else to say about that besides they dared to replace Freddie Mercury. And I've listened to a clip with Adam Lambert. I still feel kind of awkward about it because he's got the capability and he's he's a charismatic guy. He, you know, came up through TV. So sure, sure. he's got the American Idol background there. But in terms of taking over someone like Freddie Mercury. Yeah, I th- you know what my preferred avenue for something like that is. And you can't necessarily do this with an ongoing tour. I love the revolving door of this one megastar is going to do this one song and you'll do like a tribute concert is usually how it shapes up. There's actually just one for Linkin Park recently, which I haven't had a chance to check out. I, I kind of want to see how that was handled. Sounds like it was amazing. But when someone passes away, there's still a legacy to that music. And in some cases, you can replace the singer. And Alice in Chains is another example of that yeah, as well. Sure. You don't want to lose that legacy. At the same time, how offensive do you want to get about that replacement? Offensive is not the right word, but maybe it's the exact right word. You know, we hear about bands that break up all the time. They do it because they lose that element that makes them who they are. Yeah. I'll bring back XTC real quick because when Barry Andrews left, they changed themselves, but didn't change the name. They just brought in the guitarist and they changed their identity. It worked out in their favor. Same thing recently happened for uh, Blink-182 where you have yes. Tom DeLong yes. in and out over the years. And now we got uh, Matt Skiba from Alkaline Trio. And uh, as opposed to previous outfits like uh, Plus 44 and uh, Boxcar Racer where they did their own kind of side projects, they didn't call it Blink, even though over here it was Tom and Travis and over here it was Mark and Travis. Here, uh, they decided to just keep the Blink name. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. But I mean, they're all young enough guys that they can still get away with it, though. Mark Hoffes is older than yeah. <laughs> you think he is. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, let's talk about longevity here and legacy because, but what I want to do is I want to change to another band here where when their main influence left, unfortunately, untimely, they decided to change themselves in a very interesting way and are still successful at it. That is the Grateful Dead. Mm-hmm. So Jerry Garcia dies in 1995. Really unfortunate. The main drive behind a lot of their power and strength as a group was in that uh, one figure. But they changed their name a couple of times, actually. They were the Dead once. Uh, I forget mm-hmm. some other variations. But they are now Dead and Company and John Mayer. But the whole idea that not only did they change their band name, but here comes this new guy is an excellent guitarist. We know John Mayer. Absolutely. He's a recognizable yeah. name. But fascinating that John Mayer kind of gives up his own solo career. Not really gives up, but in addition to his solo career, goes with this legendary touring band. Mm-hmm. And that becomes a part of his regular gig as well. It was first just like a flirtation, if you will. Yeah. But apparently they got they got along so well that they continued it into this and so what i want to do mike is i want to have you read this quote here from bob weir who's one of the figureheads of the group and just his attitude towards bringing in these uh, this is in addition to two other guys who are young and in the group so it's not just john mayer who's the young guy there's two other guys as well we were playing and suddenly i was viewing this from about 20 feet behind my head and i looked over john from that point of view and it was 20 years later and john was almost fully gray i looked over at O'Teal, and his hair was 
white. I looked over to my left and Jeff's hair was all gray. So he's looking specifically at where he and this guy Mickey Hart and this other guy Kreutzmann would be playing. It was new guys, younger guys holding forth, doing a great job, playing with fire and aplomb. It changed my whole view of what it is we're up to. I find myself wondering, well, what are they going to be saying about this new approach or this honoring of this tradition? What are they going to be saying about that in 200 or 300 years at the Berkeley School of Music? That's the kind of stuff that goes through my head now because this legacy here, there's a chance now that they'll be talking about us in years to come. So I find it incumbent on myself to think in those terms. This quote blew me away because it gave me the sense that what he's alluding to is the idea that as these band members move on, they're replaced with someone younger. They could theoretically continue that group. If you can do that with your fans, yeah. then it makes sense that you could do it with the band themselves. Absolutely. And when you put real talent in there, like with John Mayer, you're setting the stage to basically be able to take that band and make it a multi-generational thing rather than just keep it a relic of the past. I mean, Lord knows if the songs themselves actually carry on past when all the members uh, uh, pass away and when their fans all pass away and it goes to the younger generation, if it's going to continue in that same way. Can you really say that you've ever seen that kind of a thing happen in rock music? And I Can can't you say, say I that have. you're even seeing that band anymore? Right. So I think of, is there a central figure that defines that band? Is there one last holdout? Again, to take it back to what I just went to, the only original member of Real Big Fish right now is the lead vocalist, Aaron. Mm. If Aaron were to leave, would there no longer be Real Big Fish? Because all the other members have cycled in and out and everyone that I just saw, I had never seen before, despite seeing that band countless times right. over the years. Right. And this is one of those examples where Jerry Garcia was, like you said, such the figurehead of that band. So when you lose the vocalist, like we have all these other examples of these bands, either someone passed away or they don't get along with vocalists anymore. Van Halen's a great example where you have these two massive lead performers of this band. When is there a point where the band is no longer the band? And I think this is a great example, a great discussion, a great exercise in, well, we're just going to try it and see if we can continue this forever. So is that a good strategy? I'd love to hear from you guys about this. We are on Reddit, low fidelity there. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter. Let's have a discussion about this. I think it's a really interesting prospect. Especially if any of you are same age, same area as me, and was seeing Catch-22 and Streetlight Manifesto at the same time. Love to hear your opinion on that. Anyway, let's continue. Right. Okay, so one more subset of bands who continue to tour or come back and tour. Mm -hmm. It's this relatively new phenomenon. Not really new, but like commonplace new. It's another extension of the We Can Sell Nostalgia to People. Yeah, and that is the album anniversary tours, which was sort of this kitschy thing that only certain artists could get away with. And the big example example I think of right away is Pink Floyd because how many times has the wall been played with Roger Waters with a number of guests and tributes and whatever yeah. and, and and doing it at spotlight moments or certain events in time or, or for certain political reasons but Dark Side of the Moon was played in its entirety during the Pulse tour. You have this group basically performing the album from beginning to end, no adjustments or changes Right. and so I mean that's hitting upon nostalgia very closely because you're not altering the way that they've heard the songs in their progression Mm -hmm. You're kind of taking that moment in time for them and putting it into a live venue. I have some interesting thoughts to this, but before we get to that, I want to bring up other examples here. You two have done it recently with 30 years since Joshua Tree came out. So, of course, they're doing a 30 year anniversary tour, playing the album straight through. Andrew Poles turn on the bright lights, 15 years old. They did that. This group, Tegan and Sarah, 10 years of their album, The Con, which was uh, one of their more popular releases. Everclear in 2015 toured on the 20th anniversary of Sparkle and Fade. Although here's my favorite example, Mike. Toad the Wet Sprocket. They decided to play only half the songs from their album Coil on their anniversary tour because eh, they figured fans would want to hear hits from the earlier records. Yep. It's like where that, where that kind of backfires on them a Absolutely. little bit. Absolutely. I've seen some of this as well. I've been to quite a few of these shows, actually. One of the tours I mentioned earlier, I'm pretty sure it was uh, that combination tour would say anything and saves the day was for 10 and 15 year anniversaries of some of their respective albums. I'm pretty sure it was Is a Real Boy and uh, Through Being Cool. And that's when they did the Two Tongues song. Opening up for that show was Reggie in the Full Effect. And he was just in an opening position, but they were also billing that as, I want to say it was a 10 year for promotional coffee, but he didn't really have enough time to play the full album. So he basically just sort of played some of the songs. It was like a normal Reggie set, but kind of billed as that. Sometimes you get in those tough positions where I'm being billed as this, but I can't actually effectively do this in the time that I'm given. My thought on it may be slightly controversial. Unless you're Pink Floyd, just don't do it. It's one thing when you have an experience at a live show and you want to relive that mm -hmm. and that's your nostalgia tour but when you're listening to an album the band wasn't there when i listened 
into the album. Right. That was an experience that I had on my own that I enjoyed the album as it was in the t- time and place that I listened to it. And if I'm going to enjoy, if I'm going to really enjoy it and you tell people about it, album. I'm going to listen to the album. And I'm going to make a podcast about the albums yeah. that I love. But I don't need to see it done live. Fair that they do this, and I'm not saying they shouldn't do it because fans may want this depending on what the context is. But from my point of view, I don't feel like the excitement I get from listening to an album that is well produced, well mastered, is going to be replicated in any way by having the people there slightly older having moved on from this this experience or should have moved on from this experience and then having it to replay it with a less than standard listening experience. Mm. I'll give you one example that I really appreciated um, that he, he did it this way. And that's Chris Caraba, Dashboard Confessional. He did a 10 year tour on Swiss Army Romance, which was in 2000. So the show must have been in 2010. What I liked about that is he did the show by himself with the acoustic guitar. This is at the point in 2010, he had already redefined what emo was. Think about in 2010, he had uh, Vindicated in Spider-Man 2. Uh, his albums were, were blowing up. He was at that point, he had transitioned Dashboard into a full band, into a full electric band. You weren't necessarily ever going to get some of these songs played again as Chris with a guitar. So to have that chance to recapture that again, packaged as the 10 year anniversary of this album was pretty cool. Well, that's sort of like an outlier, wouldn't you say? I think so. But that's why I say I appreciated that one, even though it was literally the we are selling you the nostalgia of this album 10 years later in its circumstance. I thought it was a little different. It was the outlier. Oh, interesting. But I mean, it worked out in that case. It sounds like you definitely enjoyed the show. Yeah, except for the girls in front of me that were yelling and screaming the whole time. That yeah, was... right. Well, we'll have to get into the, uh, yeah. the anatomy of a, of a tour date, if you will. <laughs> My later wife on. almost got into a fight. Right. <laughs> oh, great. That's wonderful. I want to bring it to a quote from Everclear's lead frontman, Art Alexakis. He said, it's become this thing where that's what you do now. I know. It's like you've resigned yourself to this fate. Bands playing cruise ships, bands going to Las Vegas yep, and this is the residence. Thing. Billy Joel has a residence in Madison Square Garden. Can I tell you that every time I've gone to Las Vegas, I miss Boys to Men by a week and it's killing me. Oh, really? Yeah. Man, just bad timing in it that is. case. I know. We've discussed so many things about touring. We're going to end it here. These are plenty of topics that you might want to consider if you're in a band and you want to go on the road or not. Feel free to consider all these examples. I feel like we've covered a wide gamut of topics. I think, though, the great way to end this is with a lyric from a song from James Taylor, who knows very well about constantly touring. And uh, this is from his song, That's Why I'm Here from 1985. And just for some proper context, his most popular song is Fire and Rain. So you'll see why this lyric is appropriate. Fortune and fame, such a curious game. Perfect strangers can call you by name. Pay good money to hear fire and rain again and again and again. Some are like summer coming back every year. Got your baby, got your blanket, got your bucket of beer. I break into a grin from ear to ear and suddenly it's perfectly clear. That's why I'm here. So on that note, that is our discussion on whether to tour or not to tour. We are always interested in hearing your take and your thoughts on our discussions. To join us on our subreddit or send us your take, feedback at lowfidelity.info. On the next episode, we are going to conclude our first phase of XTC Love with our review and analysis of their 1982 double album English Settlement. Until then, thank you for listening to Low Fidelity, and we'll see you again in a couple weeks. So one particular... I hate saying so all the time. I do that. I've noticed... Every topic that I have started for 12 years. So. So, blah, blah, blah. Fuck it, Mike. Stop saying the word. I I do it every episode. I'm going to do it where it's like I'm going to say it and I'm going to start again and just take out the word and it'll be perfect. Yep. I apologize. So. (laughs) Damn it. Oh, my God. It is so hard not to do it. You put that as an outtake at the end. I'm going to try. That is a.